Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara and Lily's back there. And as always, I'd like to remind you to stay safe and healthy. Hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell, please. Today, we are going to get back to the Diary of Anne Frank. And we left off at her diary entry. What I mean, entries, not chapters. Her di uh, Friday, October 16th, 1942. Hi, Jamie. Dear Kitty, I'm terribly busy. <laughs> she can stay. I'm terribly busy. I've just translated a chapter out of La Belle Nivernais and made notes of new words. Then a perfectly foul math problem in three pages of French grammar. I flatly refuse to do these math problems every day. Daddy agrees that they are vile. I'm almost better at them than he is. Oops, fix that. I'm almost better at them than he is. Though neither of us are much good, and we often have to fetch Margot. <coughs> On the furthest on of the three of us in shorthand, yesterday I finished the assault. She's up to no good. It's quite amusing. Hold on. No, Jamie, you're not going to ruin that. There you go. Sorry. It's quite amusing, but doesn't touch Jupiter Huel. As a matter of fact, I think Sissy Van Marksfeld is a first-rate writer. I shall definitely let my children read her books. Mommy, Margot, and I are as thick as thieves again. It's really much better. Margot and I got in the same bed together last evening. It was a frightful squash, but that was just the fun of it. She asked if she could read my diary. I said yes, at least bits of it. And then I asked if I could read hers, and she said yes. Then we got on to the subject of the future. Oh, wouldn't it have been nice to be able to see her diary? Subject of the future. I asked her what she wanted to be, but she wouldn't say and made a great secret of it. I gathered something about teaching. I'm not sure if I'm right, but I really but I think so. Really, I shouldn't be so curious. This morning I was lying on Peter's bed, having chased him off at first. He was he was furious with me, not that I cared very much. He might be a bit more friendly with me for once. After all, I did give him an apple yesterday. I asked Margot if he, she thought I was very ugly. She said that I was quite attractive and that I had nice eyes. Rather vague, don't you think? <laughs> Till next time, yours, Anne. Tuesday, October 20th, 1942. Dear Kitty, my hand still shakes, though it's two hours since we had the shock. I should explain that there are five fire extinguishers in the house. We knew that someone was coming to fill them, but no one had warned us when the carpenter or whatever you call them was coming. The result was that we were sh ma weren't making any attempt to keep quiet until I heard hammering outside in the lynn, the opposite our cupboard door. I thought of the carpenter at once and warned Ellie who was having a meal with us, that she couldn't go downstairs. Daddy and I posted ourselves at the door so as to hear when the man left. After he'd been working for a quarter of an hour, he laid his hammer and tools down on top of our cupboard, as we thought, and knocked at our door. You know, see, it's just, that's the thing. I mean, young people are, right now they're in quarantine. But they're, I mean, we're always worried about our rights being taken away from us, this and that. But, I mean, you can't compare wearing a face mask or things like that to have to, like, not make noise in your house for fear of being dragged off to a concentration camp. And that's, you know, just what they had to deal with. And we know that poor thing ended up dying in one. He laid his hammer and tools down on top of our cupboard, as we thought, and knocked at our door. We turned absolutely white. Perhaps he had heard something after all and wanted to investigate our secret. Then it seemed like it. The knocking, pulling, pushing, and wrenching went on. I nearly fainted at the thought that this utter stranger might discover our beautiful secret hiding place. And just as I thought, I thought, I mean, that's just so sad. And just as I thought my last hour was at hand, I heard Mr. Kufus say, open the door, it's only me. We opened it immediately. The hook that holds the cover, which can be undone by people, she's up to no good again, by people who know the secret, had got jammed. That was why no one had been able to warn us about the carpenter. What do you see, girl? 
trying to harness that's one part of the house. The hook that holds the cupboard. What do you see? Okay. Well, just, you know. Which can be undone by people who know the secret had got jammed. That was why no one had been able to warn us about the carpenter. The man had now gone downstairs, and Kufuas wanted to fetch Ellie, but couldn't open the cupboard again. It was a great relief to me, I can tell you. In my imagination, the man who, th who I thought was trying to get in bed, get in, had been growing and growing in size, and until the end he appeared to be a giant and the greatest fascist that ever walked the earth. <laughs> See, that's sad. Well, well, luckily everything was okay this time. Meanwhile, we had great fun on Monday. Me up and Hank spent the dead night here. Margaret and I went in. Mommy and Daddy's room for the night so that the Van Santons could have, could have our room. The meal tasted divine. There was one small interruption. Daddy's lamp blew a fuse, and all of a sudden we were sitting in darkness. What, what was to be done? There was some fuse wire in the house. But the fuse box is right at the very back of the dark storeroom. Not even a, not such a nice job after dark. Still, the men ventured forth, and after ten minutes, we were able to put the candles away again. I got up early this morning. Hank had to leave at half past eight. After a cozy breakfast, Miep went downstairs. It was pouring, and she was glad not to have to cycle to the office. Next week, Ellie is coming to stay for a night. Yours, Anne. Thursday, October ninth. 29th, 1942. Dear Kitty, I am awfully worried. Daddy is ill. He has a high temperature and a red rash. It looks like measles. Think of it. We can't even call a doctor. <clears throat> Mummy is letting him have a good sweat. Perhaps that will send his temperature down. This morning, Miep told us that all the furniture has been removed from Van Dan's home. We haven't told Mrs. Van Dan yet. She's such a bundle of nerves already, and we don't feel like listening to another moan over all the lovely china and beautiful chairs that she left at home. We had to leave almost all our nice things behind. So what's the good of grumbling about it now? She's funny. I'm allowed to read more grown-up books lately. I'm now reading Aunt Eva's Youth by Nico Van Suchtelen. I can't see much difference between this and the school gir girl love stories. It is true that there are bits about women selling themselves in unknown, unknown men back streets. They ask a packet of mo money for it. I'd die of shame if anything like that. Like that happened to me. Also, it says that Eva has a monthly period. Oh, I'm no so long into habit too. It's well, it seems to so important poor thing. Daddy has brought the plays of Goth and Schiller from the big cupboard. He is going to read to me every evening. We started with Don Carlos. Following Daddy's good example, Mummy has pressed her prayer book into my hand. For decency's sake, I've read some of the prayers in German. They are certainly beautiful, but they don't convey much to me. Why does she force me to be pious, just to oblige her? Tomorrow we are going to light the fire for the first time. I expect we shall be suffocated with smoke. The chimney hasn't been swept for ages. Let's hope the thing draws. <laughs> um, Saturday, November 7th, 1942. Dear Kitty, Mummy is frightfully irritable, and that always seems to herald unpleasantness for me. Is it just a chance that Daddy and Mummy never rebuke Margo and that they always drop on me for everything? Yesterday evening, for instance, Margo was reading a book with lovely drawings in it. She got up and went upstairs put the book down, ready to go on with it later. I wasn't doing anything, so I picked up the book and started looking at pictures. Margaret came back, saw her book in my hands, wrinkled her forehead, and asked for the book back. Just because I wanted to look a little further on, Margot got more and more angry. Then Mummy joined in. Get the book to Margot. She was reading it, she said. Daddy came into the room. He didn't even know what it was all about. but saw the injured look on Margot's face. <laughs> and promptly dropped on me. I'd like to see what you'd say if Margot ever started looking at one of your books. I gave way at once, laid the book down, and left the room off offhanded, offended, excuse me. As they thought it is so, it so happened, I was neither offended nor cross, just miserable. 
I was, it wasn't right of Daddy to judge without knowing what the squabble was about. I would have given Margot the book myself much more quickly if Mummy and Daddy hadn't interfered. They took Margot's part at once, as though she were the victim of some great injustice. It's obvious that Mummy would stick up for Margot. She and Margot always do back, e back each other up. I'm so used to that, that I'm utterly indifferent to both Mummy's jarring and Margot's moods. I love them, but only because they are Mummy and Margot. With Daddy, it's different. If he holds Margot up as an example, proves of what she does, praises and caresses her, then something gnaws at me inside because I adore Daddy. He is the one I looked up to. I don't love anyone in the world but him. He doesn't notice that he treats Margot differently from me. Now Margot is just the prettiest, sweetest, most beautiful girl in the world. But all the same, I feel I have some right to be taken seriously, too. I have always been the dunce. The ne'er do well of the family. Yeah, I wouldn't say so. I've always had to pay double for my deeds, first with the scolding, and then quite, and then again because of the way that my feelings are hurt. Now I'm satis not satisfied with this parent favoritism anymore. I want something from Daddy that he is not able to give me. I'm not jealous of Margaret. Never have been. I don't envy her good looks or her beauty. It is only that I long for Daddy's real love, not only as his child, but for me and myself. I cling to Daddy because it only it is only through him that I am able to retain the remnant of family feeling. Daddy doesn't understand that I need to give vent to my feelings over Mummy sometimes. He doesn't want to talk about it. He simply avoids anything which might lead to remarks about Mummy's feelings. Just the same. Mummy and her feelings are something I feel, find harder to bear, bear than anything else. I don't know how to keep it all to myself. I can't always be drawing attention to her untidiness, her sarcasm and her lack of sweetness, N neither can I believe that I am always in the wrong. We are exact opposites in everything, so naturally we are bound to run up against each other. I don't pronounce judgment on Mummy's character, for that is something I can't judge. I only look at her as a mother, and she doesn't just doesn't succeed in being that to me. I have to be my own mother. I've drawn myself apart from them all. I am my own shipper, skipper, and later on I shall see where I come to land. All this comes about particularly because I have in my mind's eye an image of what a perfect mother and wife sh should be, and in her, whom I must call mother, I find no trace of that image. I am always making resolutions not to notice Mummy's bad example. I want to see only the good side of her and to seek in myself what I cannot find in her. But it doesn't work, and the worst of it is, neither Daddy nor Mummy understands this gap in my life. And I blame them for it. I wonder if anyone can ever succeed in making their, their children absolutely content. Sometimes I believe that God wants to try me, both now and later on. I must become good through my own efforts, without examples, without good advice. Then later on I shall be of all, all, that, all the stronger. Who besides me will ever read these letters? From whom but myself shall I get comfort? As I read, comforting often. I frequently feel weak and dissatisfied with myself. My shortcomings are too great. I know this, and every day I try to improve myself again and again. My treatment varies so much. One day Anne is so sensible and is allowed to know everything, and the next day I hear that Anne is just a silly little goat who doesn't know anything at all, and imagines that she's learned a wonderful lot from books. I'm not a baby or a spoilt darling anymore to be laughed at. Whatever she does, I have my own views, plans, and ideas, though I can't put them into words yet. Oh, so many things bubble up inside me as I lie in bed, having to put up with people I've been fed up with, who always misinterpret my intentions. That's why in the, wor why in the end I always come back to my diary. That is when I start and finish, because Kitty is always patient, I'll promise her that I shall persevere in spite of everything and find my own way through it all and swallow my tears. Only wish I could see the results already or occasionally receive encouragement from someone who loves me. Don't condemn me. Remember, rather than sometimes, I can too can reach the bursting point. Yours, Am. Monday, November 9, 1942. Dear Kitty, yesterday was Peter's birthday. He was 16. He had come... He had some nice presents, among other things, a game of Monopoly, a razor, and a lighter. Not that he smokes much. It's really just for show. 
The biggest surprise came from Mr. Van Dam when, at one o'clock, he announced that the British had landed in Tunis, Algiers, Casablanca, and Oran. This is the beginning of the end, everyone was saying. But Churchill, the pr British Prime Minister, who had probably heard the same thing in England, said, This is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. But it is, perhaps, the end of the beginning. Do you see the difference? Yeah. There is certainly reason for optimism. Stalingrad, the Russian town, which they have already been def defending the three months, been defending for three months, still hasn't fallen into German hands. But to return to affairs in our secret den, I must tell you something about our food supply. As you know, we have some really greedy pigs on the top floor. We get our bread from a nice baker, friend of Kufuas. We don't get so much as we used to at home, naturally, but it's sufficient. Four ration cards have been have also been brought, bought illegally. The price is going up all the time. It has now gone up from, my nose itches, 27 florins to 33. And all that for a little slip of printed paper. In order to have something to in the house that will keep apart from our t 150 tins of vegetables, we have bought 270 pounds of dry beans, peas and beans. They are not all, all for us. Some are for the office people. They are in sacks which hang on hooks in our little passage inside the hidden door. Owing to the, <laughs> the cat. Owing to the weight of the contents, a few stitches in the sack. Sorry. And the sacks burst open, so we decided that it would be better to put our winter store in the attic and Peter was given the job of dragging it all up there. He had managed to get five of the six sacks upstairs intact, and he was just too busy pulling up number six. When the bottom seam of the sack split and, sh and a shower, no, a positive hailstorm of brown beans came pouring down and rattled down the stairs. There, was about, there were about 50 pounds in the sacks, hey, sweetheart, and the noise was enough to waken the dead. Downstairs, they thought the old house with all its contents was coming down on them. Thank God they, there was no strangers in the house. It gave Peter a moment's fright. But he was soon roaring with laughter, especially when he saw me standing at the bottom of the stairs like a little island in the middle of a sea of beans. I was entirely surrounded up to my ankles in beans. Quickly, we started to pick them up. But beans are so slippery and small that they seem to roll into all the possible and impossible corners and holes. Now, every time anyone goes downstairs, they bend down once or twice in order to be able to set Mrs. Van Dean, Mrs. Van Dean with a handful of beans. I'd almost forgotten to mention that Daddy is quite better again. Yours, Anne. P.S. The news that has just come over the radio that Algiers has fallen, Morocco, Casablanca, and Oran have been in British hands for several days. Now we are waiting for the Tunis. Tuesday, November 10th, 1942. Dear Kitty, great news. We want to take in an eighth person. Yes, really. We've always thought that there was quite enough room and food for one more. We were only afraid of giving Kafuas and Kralin more trouble. But now that the appealing stories we hear about Jews are getting even worse, the appalling stories, excuse me, we hear about Jews are getting worse, Daddy got hold of the two people who had to decide, and they thought it was an excellent plan. It is just as dangerous for seven as for eight, they said, and quite rapidly. When this was settled, we went th ran through our circle of friends, trying to think of a single person who would fit in well with our family. It wasn't difficult to fit hit on someone after Daddy had refused all members of the Van Dan family. We chose a dentist called Albert Dussel, whose wife was fortunate enough to be out of the country when war broke out. He is known to be quiet, and so far as we and Mr. Van Dean, Don, Dan can judge from a superficial acquaintance, both families think he is a congenial person. Yep knows him too, so she'll be able to make arrangements for him to join us. If he comes, he will have to sleep in my room instead of Margot, who will use the camp bed. Yours, Anne. Thursday, November 12th, 1942. Dear Kitty, Dessel was awful, awfully pleased when Miep told him that she had got a hiding place for him. She urged him to come as soon as possible, preferably Saturday. 
He thought that this was rather doubtful, since he had to bring his card index up to date first, see to a couple of patients, and settle his accounts. Yep came to us with the news this morning. We thought it was unwise of him to put it all up, to put it off. All these preparations entail explanations to a number of people whom we would rather keep out of it. Me up is going to ask if he can't manage to come on Saturday afternoon. Saturday after all, excuse me. Tussle said no. Now he is coming on Monday. I must say I think it's pretty crazy that he doesn't jump at the proposal, whatever it is. If he were to get picked up outside, would he still be able to do the, his card index, settle to his finances, and see to his patients? Why delay then? I think it's stupid of Dad to have given him had to have given in no other news. Yours, Anne. Tuesday, November 7th, 1942. Dear Kitty, Dussel has arrived. All went well. Miep has told him that he must be at a special place in front of the post office at 11 o'clock where man would meet him. Dussel was standing at the rendezvous dead on time. Mr. Kafuas, who knows Dussel too, went up to him and told him that the said gentleman could not come but asked whether he would just go up Go to me up at the office. Kafuas got into a tram and went back to the office. <laughs> Let me see where that is. Okay. While well, Dussel walked in the same direction. Twenty past eleven, Dussel tapped at the office door. Me up helped him off with his coat so that the yellow star would not be seen and took him to the private office where Kafuas engaged him in conversation until the chairwoman had gone. Then Miep went downstairs with Dussel under the pretext that the private office was needed for something. Opening the swinging cover and stepping and stepped inside before the eyes of the dump out of Dussel, we all sat around the table upstairs, waiting with coffee and co cognac to greet the newcomer. Miep showed him into our sitting room first. He recognized our furniture at once and had not the remotest idea that we were there above his head. When Miep told him, he nearly passed out with surprise. But luckily, luckily Miep didn't give him much time and took him straight upstairs. Dussel sank into a chair speechless and looked at us all for a while, as if he had to really take it all in first. After a while, he stuttered, But Aber Sin Juna in Belgium, then. Is der Milder nicht come? Das Otto, the escape is see nicht successful. We explained everything to him, but that we had spread the story above the soldiers and the car on purpose to be put. Hold on, let me get back to that. To be put, to put, excuse me, people, and especially the Germans, on the wrong track should they try to find us. Dussel was again struck dumb by such an ingenuity, and when he had explored further our super practical, exquisite little secret annex. He could do nothing but gaze about him in astonishment. We all had lunch together. Then he had a little nap and joined us for tea. Tidied up his things a bit. Yep, it brought them beforehand. And began to feel more at home. Especially when he received the following type secret annex rules. Van Dan product. Prospectus and guide to the secret annex. Special institution as a temporary residence for Jews and such like. Open all the year round. Beautiful, quiet, free from woodland surroundings. In the heart of Amsterdam. Can be reached by trams 13 and 17. Also by car or bicycle. In special cases, also on foot. If the Germans prevent the use of transport. Board and lodgings free. Special fat-free diet. Running water in the bathroom, alas, no bath. And down various inside and outside walls. Ample storage room for all types of goods. Own radio center, direct communication with London, New York, Tel Aviv, and numerous other stations. This appliance is only for residents' use of after 6 o'clock in the evening. No stations are forbidden. On the understanding that German stations are only listened to in special cases, such as classical music and the like. Rest hours, 10 o'clock in the evening until 7.30 in the morning. 10.15 10, on Sundays. Residents may rest during the day. Conditions permitting as the directors indicate. For reasons of public security, rest hours must be strictly observed. Holidays outside the home postponed indefinitely. 
use of language speak softly at all times by order. All civilized language are permitted, if we're no German. <laughs> lessons. One written shorthand his lesson per week. English, French, mathematics, and history at all times. Small pets. Special department permit is necessary. Good treatment available. Vermin accepted. Meal times. Breakfast every day except Sunday and bank holidays. 9 a.m. Sundays and bank holidays. 11.30 a.m. Appro approximately. Lunch not very big. 1.15 p.m p.m. to 1.45 p.m. Dinner, cold and or hot, no fixed time, depending on the news broadcast. Duties, residents must always be ready to help with office work. Baths, the wash tub is available for all residents from 9 a.m. on Sundays. The WC, kitchen, private office, or main office, whichever preferred, are available. Alcoholic beverages only with doctor's prescription. And your Zans. You, you see, I mean, sometimes there are things that are put in place for your safety and say, and, you know, well being. And to complain about it is just ridiculous. Thursday, November 19th, 1942. Dear Kitty, Dussel is a very nice man, but just as we had all imagined, of course he thought it was all right to share my little room. Quite honestly, I'm not so keen that a stranger should use my things. But one must be prepared to make some sacrifices for a good cause, so I shall make my little offering with a good will. If we can save someone, then everything else is of secondary importance, says Daddy. And he's absolutely right. The first thing that Dussel was here, he immediately asked me all sorts of questions. When does the charwoman come? When can one use the bathroom? When is one allowed to use the laboratory? You may laugh, but these things are not so simple in a hiding place. During the day, we mustn't make any noise that might be heard downstairs. And if there's some stranger, such as the charwoman, for example, then we have to be extra careful. I explained all this carefully to Dussel, but one thing amazed me. He's very slow in the uptake. He asks everything twice over and still doesn't seem to remember. Sounds like a joke. That's it. <laughs> Perhaps that will wear off in time. It's only that he's thoroughly upset by the sudden change in Apart from that, all goes well. Dussel has told us a lot about the outside world, which we have missed for so long now. He had very sad news. Countless friends and acquaintances have gone to such a terrible fate. Even, evening after evening, the green and gray army lorries trundle past. The Germans ring at every front door to inquire if there are any Jews living in the house. If there are, then the whole family has to go at once. If they don't find any, then they go on to the next house. No one has a chance of evading them unless one goes into hiding. Often they go around with lists and only ring when they know they can get a good haul. Sometimes they let them them off for cash so much per head. So much per head. Seems like the slave hunts of olden times. But it's certainly no joke. It's much too tragic for that. In the evenings when it's dark, I often see rows of good innocent people accompanied by crying children walking on and on and charge a couple of these chaps. Bullied and knocked about until they were um, until they almost drop. No one is spared. Old people, babies, expectant mothers, the sick, each and all join in the march of death. How fortunate we are here, so well cared for and undisturbed. We wouldn't have to worry about all this misery were it not that we are so anxious about all those dear to us when we can no longer help, whom we can no longer help. I feel wicked sleeping in a warm bed while my dearest friends have been knocked down or fall, have fallen into a gutter somewhere out in the cold night. I got frightened when I think, I get frightened when I think of close friends who have no, now been delivered into the hands of cruelest brutes that walk the earth, and all because they are Jews. Yours, Anne. Friday, November 20th, 1942. Dear Kitty, none of us really knows how to take it all. The news about the Jews had not really penetrated through to us until now, and we thought it best to remain as cheerful as possible. Every now and then, when Miep lets out Something about what has happened to a friend. Mummy and Mrs. Van Dan always begin to cry, so Miep thinks it better not to tell us anymore. But Dussel was immediately plied with questions from all sides. 
and the stories he told us were so stories he told us were so gruesome and dreadful that one can't get them out of one's mind. Yet we shall have our jokes and tease each other when these horrors have faded a bit in our minds. It won't do us any good or help those outside to go on being as gloomy as we are at the moment. And what would be the object of making our secret annex into a secret annex of gloom? Must I keep thinking about those other people, whatever I'm doing? And if I want to laugh about something, should I stop myself quickly and feel ashamed that I am cheerful? Ought I then to cry the whole day long? No, that I can't do. That I can't do. Besides, in time, this gloom will wear off. Added to this misery, there's another, but of a purely personal kind, and it pales into insignificant beside beside all the wretchedness I've just told you about. Still, I can't refrain from telling you that lonely, telling you that lately I've been gone to feel deserted. I'm surrounded by too great a void. I never used to feel like this. My fun and amusements and my girlfriends have completely filled my thoughts. Now I neither either think about unhappy things or about myself. And at long last I had made the discovery that Daddy, although he such a darling, still cannot take the place of my entire little world of bygone days. But why do I bother you with such foolish things? I'm very grateful, Kitty. I know that, but it is but it often makes my head swim if I'm jumped upon too much. And then on top of that, have to think about all those other mis miseries. Saturday, November 28th, 1942. We have used we have used to use too much electricity, more than one ration. Result, the utmost economy, the prospect of having to cut it off, having it cut off, no light for a fortnight. A pleasant thought, that but who knows? Perhaps it won't happen after all. It's too dark to read in the afternoon. The four or half past, we pass the time in all sorts of crazy ways, asking riddles, physical training in the dark, talking English and French, criticizing books, but it all begins to pall in the end. Yesterday's evening, I discovered something new to peer through a powerful pair of field glasses into the lighted rooms of the houses at the back. In the daytime, we can't allow even as much as a centimeter's chink to appear between our curtains, but it can't do any harm after dark. I never knew before that neighbors could be such interesting people. At any rate, ours are. I found one couple having a meal. One family was in the act of ta taking a home movie, and the dentist opposite was just attending to an old lady who was awfully scared. It was always said about Mrs. Mr. Dussel that he could get on wonderfully with children. They loved them all. Now he shows himself in his true colors. He's a dodgy, old-fashioned disciplinarian and a preacher of long, drawn-out sermons on manners. As I have an un unusual good fortune, number one, to share my bedroom, alas, a small one, with his lordship, and as I'm generally considered to be the most badly behaved of the three, three young people, I have a lot to put up with and have to pretend to be deaf in order to escape the old, much repeated tickings off and warnings. All this wouldn't be too bad. Wouldn't be, wouldn't be too bad if he wasn't such a frightfully, frightful sneak and he didn't pick on mummy of all people to sneak to every time when I've already just had a dose of him, dose from him. Mommy goes over it all again, so I get a gale aft as well as four. Then, if I'm really lucky, I'm called on to give an account of myself to Mrs. Van Dan, and then to get a veritable hurricane. Honestly, you needn't think it's easy to be the badly brought up central figure of a hypocritical family in hiding. When I lie in bed at night and think over the many sins and shortcomings attributed to me, I get so confused by it all that I neither laugh or cry. It depends what sort of mood I am in. There, I fall as then I fall asleep with a stupid feeling of wishing to be different from what I am, from what I want to be, perhaps to behave differently from the way I want to behave or do, be or do behave. Oh, heavens above me. now, I'm getting you in... You're in a muddle, too. Forgive me, but I don't like crossing things out. And in these days of paper shortage, we are not allowed to throw paper away. Therefore, I can only advise you not to read the last sentence, certainly not to try to understand it, 
because you won't succeed anyhow. Yours, Anne. Monday, December 7th, 1942. Dear Kitty, Hanukkah and St. Nicholas Day came almost together lot this year. Just one day's differences. difference. We didn't make much fuss about Hanukkah. We just gave each other a few little presents, and then we had the candles because of the shortage of candles. We only had them light for ten minutes, but it is all right as long as you have the song. Mr. Van Dan has made a wooden candlestick, so that too is all properly arranged. Saturday, the evening of St. Nicholas Day, was much more fun. Yep and Ellie had made us very exquisite by, excuse me, had made us very inquisitive by whispering all the time with Daddy, so naturally we guessed that something was on. And so it was. At eight o'clock we all filed down the wooden staircase with the passage in pitch darkness. It made me shudder and wish that I was safely upstairs again into the little darkness, into the little dark room. There, as there are no windows, we were we were able to turn a light on, turn uh, turn on a light. When that was done, Daddy opened the big cupboard. Oh, how lovely, we all cried. A large basket decorated St. Nicholas paper stood in the corner, and on top there was a mask of Black Peter. We quickly took the basket upstairs with us. It was a nice little present for everyone with a suitable poem attached. I got a doll whose skirt is a bag for odds and ends. Daddy got a book, got bookends, and so on. In any case, it was a nice idea, and as none of us had ever celebrated St. Nicholas, it was a good way of starting. And I'm going to stop there. My next, uh, the next diary, whoops, I need a ruler. Next diary entry will be December 10th, Thursday, December 10th, 1942. But if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And stay tuned for more from, huh, I got rip my finger, diary from Anne Frank with Stara, Jamie here, Lily. As, like I said, I stay, as always, stay safe and healthy and have a great day.